Welcome to Apple Arcade Plus, the show where you get to hear from the people behind Apple Arcade games. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. It's actually all built on iPad, a majority of it, because even on an iPad, you can actually paint much better and it's more creative process to do it that way than you would on a computer because drawing with a mouse, unless you have a vacuum to draw with, drawing on an iPad is just a lot more smooth feeling. We have the right resolution. You can instantly click to play the game and it just feels natural way to do it. So yes, we have an editor where you can paint all the lines. You can have all the start point, end points. You can create the hints. Also so if you look at the hand that are painting and the hints, that's actually a designer who have solved the level at that exact speed to help you throughout the game. And we'll continue developing an iPad because it just feels normal and we want to go for that handcrafted feel rather than the computer generation. Welcome to Apple Arcade Plus. In this episode, you'll be hearing from Jacob, the founder of Leica Studios. Leica Studios is the small team behind the game Tint. This is an Apple Arcade game I fell in love with right away. This puzzle game will have you relearning how color mixing works and really engages both the creative and logical parts of your brain at the same time in a really unique way. It is one of those games that feels right at home on the iPad with the Apple Pencil, and as you heard in the opening clip, this is a game that was designed on the iPad. You'll hear much more on the prototyping and design process of Tint in this interview, and it was fascinating hearing about the creation process of this game. I really hope you enjoy this episode. It was a really fun game to learn more about. And if you enjoyed this episode, please head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Every review goes a really long way in helping others discover the show. You can send your feedback to me at applearcadepodcast at gmail.com. You can find the website at applearcadepodcast.com and you can follow the show on Twitter at Apple Arcade Plus, plus spelled out. With that said, here's my interview with Jacob, all about Tint. Enjoy. Hi, Jacob. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tim. So can you first introduce Tint and you know yourself and your game? My name is Jacob Ligegor. I'm based in Thailand, but originally from Denmark. I've been doing gaming out here for many years. With my current studio, Ligu Studios, we created Tint, which is a game we started in around January this year. Fantastic. And I must say, it is a really just creative game. It's a peaceful way to spend some time. I think with the iPad is the best way to play that, but... Uh, Really great work with Tint. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. Yeah, I guess it was being in Bangkok, there is a lot of hectic going on here. You kind of want a place that you can relax and do something that is not too time intensive, something that you can just relax a little bit with. And that's also kind of the way we try to dream our way out of maybe living somewhere in southern France instead at time. Yeah. So the idea for Tint, where did that come from? Did it come from the idea of, let me go to a more peaceful place and do some painting or... We've always been doing a few different games, usually on uh, we've been doing on AR, on VR, something with machine learning. This time we missed just doing a game that was also beautiful, nice, pleasing puzzle. So the idea actually came out of prototyping a few different puzzles. We wanted something that to be super clean. The funny thing is our goal with this game was actually to win an Apple Design Award. So we also researched a lot of those games because in today's premium market, you also need to get the attention of the platform. So that's where we wanted to go something beautiful. And we started off with something that is just, okay, how can we have the most clean canvas, which is of course a white piece of paper. And that's when it thought the thoughts of how can we interact with that paper? How can we make it nicer? And this is when we saw an ad from Bulgari, the jewelry brand who actually has a watercolor ad where you have these beautiful lines being drawn of watercolor. And we really got fascinated also of how the watercolor kind of is fluid and it doesn't dry instantly. So it was a perfect way to play with the paint. And then, of course, it was a logically the way to go and test mixing the colors and keeping that realism. And it turned out well. Yeah. And do you have much background yourself with painting and watercolors or is this kind of new to you? You should uh, definitely see my hand drawing and my paintings. They haven't improved since fourth grade. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> my sister is super creative and I have seen her painting a lot. Uh, always admired it. I'm one of the guys that would buy an iPad Pro with a pencil because I'm thinking now is the time I should learn to draw. But no, I love the aesthetics of it. I look how it looks, but myself, uh, zero creativity on it. Gotcha. Yeah. And what I really love about Tint is you're solving these puzzles, 
but it's also kind of a refresher on how colors mix and interact with each other from the color wheel days back in school. Do you see this being a game that could be used in an educational environment to teach the basics of color and how mixing colors works? For sure. Uh, I would say, like, honestly, when, when we started this project, I didn't fully know all the colors mixer by heart. I knew how the color mix should work, but I would still have to experiment with it, with getting them together. And I can see a lot of people have really learned it this way. Some has focused on kids learning uh, color mixing. What we're figured out is that there's actually a lot more adults that doesn't remember how this works together and the kids actually remember it. It's also a good way to have a game that you can play with the family that has a small educational aspect to it while still being a little bit creative and still having that game elements that makes it fun in it. So you should be able to run it on a, on, on a school as well, but I see it more as a, as a parent playing with kids. Yeah, that's a great environment for that as well yeah in the prototyping stage for this game did you use actual paint and draw out some puzzles how well does it work in real life versus the virtual environment we downloaded all apps we could find on watercolor for the ipad played around with the pencil to be honest we didn't find any watercolor apps at the time that we were satisfied with doing watercolor takes a ton of processing power off the ipad because it needs to calculate the kind of the water density of how much it should flow when you paint, the, all the paint should keep flowing. And at that time, all the apps, including Adobe's, for example, you would first paint the line. And when you would then let go of the pencil, it would then calculate all the water flow and, and make the paint kind of move after you let go which doesn't feel natural. My developer, Tomek, studied a paper from some Adobe scientists who have actually painted in real life and digital and tried to compare it. And that's where we came up with this mixture. It's actually our own technology, but it's based about a lot of different research of how watercolor paint works. That's fascinating. And it'd be kind of amazing to have kind of a, a playground mode within Tint in the future version where people could just use that engine to paint with the different colors and create different creations outside of the main game. Yes, for sure. We can see that people enjoy playing around. There was a few places where we had to go more and ensure that this is a game. So there are things that you can do in a painting app which you will not be able to do in Tint because also early times when we were playing, we wanted to make some beautiful photos. And of course, with that, you need the different thickness of the lines, etc., which would also not improve the gameplay whatsoever. So we try to keep it as realistic as possible while still not destroying the game element of it, at least. Yeah. That makes sense. So I played Tint on an iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil. When you designed this game, is that the environment you saw that would be, I guess, ideal or where most people should play this? Yes, very much. The, the iPad Pro with the Pencil just feels natural. It's a place where you want to draw. We have even added in, not many people know, but the harder you press with a pencil, the more paint will actually come out. It's something you can't do with your finger. It doesn't help you in any way in the game, but it will make the paint thicker, just like if you would press a normal watercolor pencil towards the board. We did have some difficulty, of course, supporting the smallest devices like an iPhone SE, uh, where we did have to change a few of the levels to accommodate that. But our first design and always the key element of this has definitely been the iPad. Yeah, it, it feels right at home there. And do I dare ask, does this run on Apple TV? It seems like a very touch-oriented game. It does run on Apple TV. And to be honest, we went through a lot of iterations there. We were testing out every single game on Apple TV to figure out who has made a way that you can, with a small Siri Touch remote, draw something across from one edge of the screen to the other edge of the screen. And we simply couldn't find the right way. So we actually went more with a joystick type of mode, a mechanic that we borrowed from a uh, the game Hungry Shark, where instead of swiping on the small remote because it's little, you instead put your finger in the middle and then you can draw right, left, up, down. And we also, for Apple TV, then added a pencil in so you can see where you're drawing and you have a digital pencil, which you don't have on other devices, to easier help you, you paint and navigate. It even now has controller support. So with the iOS 13 new controller support for PlayStation Xbox controller, you can play it with that as well. And I actually think it plays a little bit better with a controller than just a, a touch remote. Yeah, because you have the joystick, which you can lock down into a position to keep moving versus trying to do the other method. Yeah, yeah, for sure. With the Apple Pencil, it's a very precise tool. Do you see some people being more creative with getting around tight spaces on the paper to solve puzzles that you couldn't really do with your finger? 
Yes. The problem was that actually most of our game design has been happening on an iPad with a pencil and a ruler. So the levels are actually drawn with a pencil on tablet. And there are some places where you have to do precision drawing to get through holes. So you can only get one line through instead of two lines. And in those cases, we had to go back and redo some of the levels because we need to support uh, iPhone SE. So you need to be able to have fat fingers play on a much smaller phone and still being able to enjoy the game. So it's something that we think about when we design levels that we need to have access on both small devices and on, on iPad. We can't just exclusively do it for pencil users, but we just try to focus at least the core experience around iPad Pro users or iPad users in general. And the ruler is kind of interesting. Did you ever consider doing a virtual ruler to help users paint straight if they struggle with dexterity in that way? So we actually internally had this discussion many times about when we've designed the levels, we have these lines that are painted in different colors to help you out and sometimes block you. We have on purpose not designed a tool to make those lines perfect because they do need to look like they're drawn by hand. And that's also why we haven't implemented anything in the game that makes you draw perfect lines, but rather our designer actually has a pencil paste on top of the iPad and draw in that way. They are even out now searching for different types of rulers that they can put physically on top of the iPad and, and paint with the pencil because it just gives it this more handcrafted type look and doesn't make it feel as uh, computer generated. That makes total sense. Now, something I noticed uh, just the sound design, just how soothing and peaceful it is. And when you move the paint faster, the, I believe, vibraphone, I'm not sure if that's accurate, that rings louder. And can you speak a little bit about the sound design and how you guys developed that? So we developed it together with uh, Kapow, who is based in Australia, our team we also work with for Amon. The rules that was there given from the beginning is that all sounds that should be made from the game has to be from real physical objects and preferably objects you could find in an art studio. So that's where everything is created by paper. All the sounds are with wind and with wind chimes. With the sound that we added to the pencil in the beginning, we actually didn't do it. And then Kapow actually came up with the idea, send us the file, we tried to implement it and it made sense because now all the colors will actually actually have their individual sound as well. So you can very easily hear when you're painting that now you are painting one color and you mix it with another color and the sound and the visuals will change at the same time. So that both helps also if you have vision impaired or even if you're playing on a small device, you can now hear when you're actually doing the right mix based on these tones. And that's where we kept them in and, and love them as well for it. And uh, what instrument is doing that again? So I actually don't remember the full instrument they have done for those specific music loops. Mm -hmm. uh, for all the others, we have several videos of them, five, ten different uh, types of paper that are folded through. So all the small different origami birds are actually them sitting with a microphone and a piece of paper, smashing it together to make it sound like a butterfly would. And uh, the same with the water drops that are in are actually drops that are recorded on a piece of paper, especially for tint, dropped on the same piece of paper that you would do watercolor on. I don't know if anybody will hear the difference on it but it just sounds good and it sounds real. We really wanted to not have music loops or anything bigger. We wanted to make sure that you felt like you were sitting in a, in a small studio and that these sounds are natural around you. So you wouldn't kind of get pulled out of that. Yeah, it's very impressive hearing how you guys went about that process because it, it does show and the audio is just fantastic in this game. So what considerations have you made for players that are colorblind? You mentioned the audio pitch changing. But uh, are there any other implementations in there to help users that are challenged in that area? Yes. Uh, so we have, if you, in the tutorial of the game, you can turn on a uh, colorblind mode if you like. And there's also people that just prefer to play with that uh, all, all the time, where we're then adding patterns below the paint that you're painting. And where we are doing with these patterns on it, let's say you are mixing yellow and blue. Let's say blue has vertical stripes and yellow has horizontal stripes. When you then mix them together and make green, you would both have the horizontal and the vertical making a grid. So in that way, you don't actually need to be able to see any of the colors to play the game. We have tested it with people who have the colorblind and also tested it on our own monitors, turning off all the 
colors. If you look at stuff like the tutorial, we have kept it to colors that are more visible to more people because there are a lot of different levels of color blindness. So the tutorial, you should actually be able to pass with not the most severe form of color blindness, but the more normal ways you can. And that's also where you can then turn on and off the colorblind mode, depending on what you prefer. Wonderful. And something I was thinking of just now is Tint progresses at a very natural rate where you're learning a new ability within this world of painting, where you'll add water, where you're able to get rid of um, part of your color. As tint expands and grows, do you see it going past where you're mixing one color with another and you start mixing, you mix once, mix twice, then a third time? Or is it from a uh, puzzle perspective, are you as advanced as you'd want to be? I actually just came from a meeting about our, our next features for the game. And this is where we are keeping the aesthetics in of keeping something that feels somewhat real. Uh, I know, for example, our paint extractor that comes on the later levels is not 100% something you could see in the real world, but keeping the aesthetics versus also keeping the game elements. So we are constantly designing new mechanics to the new levels to make them more challenging and to add new additions to the game. We try to avoid any type of uh, like magic, we call it, where things just randomly appear and it doesn't have a sense in the real world and keeping them a lot more subtle because we really enjoy to keep the level super clean with mechanics that are easy to understand but we will add on a new game mechanic every 20 to 30 levels that we produce okay that's great to hear because it, it is a lot of fun when those new mechanics do show up and it's like oh wow that's just really inventive all the new mechanics that slowly get added on as you learn how this works yeah and a lot more will come than that and something that is pretty helpful when you do get stuck is the hint UI. When you get stuck, there is this little, I'm not sure what you call it, but something that you flip down and it kind of shows you what to do next if you're stuck doing that puzzle. What kind of ways did you experiment with implementing hints and how did you land on this one? So uh, hints was actually something that came later in the game. We originally planned to have people figure it out on their own. However, we saw during all the, the play testing that there are just some times where people get stuck or where they kind of want to pass a level. And this is where we lend them a helping hand. The more most natural way to help people a helping hand is to have a shadow hand that comes in and, and guides you through. And some players use it a lot. Some players pass the entire game without it. We looked into different ways, even having a small origami insect crawl across that you could follow. But the shadow hand kind of just made it realistic in a nice way without keeping it creepy. I hate the tutorials where that comes in like a real hand that draws for you. It takes you out of the realism and it feels a little bit creepy. And that's why we try to keep it in a way that it's very supple, something that helps you through with hints that are easy to understand, but they don't necessarily give you the entire solution. And they are step-based. So you can choose to just get one hint without ruining the entire level and keeping it nice and simple. And when you do solve a puzzle, it does show a little icon of it at the very bottom where you're able to share that individual tint solution. Have you considered saving those in a way for when you're done with an entire book, you can kind of look at what you did and finished accomplishing there? We tried some levels where you would actually have to paint a specific flower or even Japanese symbols, etc. And also thought about making a photo collection where you can keep them in but for now, we just keep it in the game where we want to keep array all clutter around and just focus on the core game so you don't have to think about anything else. What we learned through the testing of the game was also that we would keep playing the game from level number one again and just go through the game over and over again. Over time, you don't necessarily try to draw more beautiful. You rather try to find new ways to solve it. Still to this day, I see new solutions to levels that are very early on that I myself have played hundreds of times uh, of solutions I have never thought about. And that's kind of a fun way. So instead of taking it over to get people to draw more beautifully and keep it and save it in albums, we more try to find new solutions that they can share with each other online. Yeah. And that is something that I am starting to replay tint and that is one of the things I'm doing. It's like, how can I solve this differently? And that is for sure something that adds to replayability in a huge way. So each of the sections of the tint book have a different title image 
does that image correlate in any way to the puzzles within that chapter of Tint? They actually do. All of these paintings commissioned by a guy called Oliver Pyle in Sussex, England. This is one of the areas where we wanted to get in a real painter to paint something unique around the game. At that time, you will, through the entire game, only see the game board. You will, in our next update that comes out soon, see a little bit more of the table, but that's it. We wanted to use these title screens to kind of say, okay, you are the painter sitting here at your table uh, painting. How would your environments look like? What are the things that you would stand up right now and paint? So if you look at all the title screens, you will actually from the very first level, you will see the house with a table where you could actually be playing tin. And that house is also what you will see throughout the last of the other four chapter screens. So we start outside the house because this is in the morning time. So this is also based on our entire weather system and everything else. We might have gone complete overboard with details on, for example, no people will have the same weather going through the game. It will feel a little bit different, but the first painting is called morning. And that's also why you in the game will see the light be more morning light. You'll see a little bit more yellowish light. You will then have the uh, chapter screen, which is a sunrise. I learned during the development of this game through Oliver that a sunrise and a sunset actually has completely different colors. So the entire nature is looking different. And that's also why when you then do the game, you will start in the morning. Then you go through the middle of the day, you will get a little bit of mist and some rain. Then you will have what happens past the rain. And in the end, you will have the evening. So if you follow the game, you'll actually see that all the origami, which are on the uh, chapters, for example, in the morning, you have some butterfly flying around. When it's raining, you have frogs, the origami, the photos, the lighting, what's on the table and these pictures are all related to whatever time of the day you're playing the game uh, split into these five chapters of 10 levels each probably have gone a little bit overboard of the details because you only play the levels 10 times and i'm not sure anybody have noticed but everything fits together and it's thought out and this is also where in new books we are developing we are actually be developing the story of the painter. There might be 1% of people who actually sees it and follows it, but you will actually be able to see and follow the story uh, of the painter who is painting this book. We wanted to keep it in a way that is very subtle, that is not something that's demanding because we want you to be able to see yourself being that painter and living your way into that world of how it would be as a player of the game. I love it. And that, that was one of my questions. If you're looking up, what are you looking at? You're in southern France. Are you looking at that painting that is in front of you? And it sounds like that is the case. That, that That's really fascinating. Exactly. When you open the game and you see the small sketches that are kind of in the pictures, in the pages in between, those are actual sketches of those pictures as well. Prior ideas, things that you would as a painter sketch in your book. And yeah, it's kind of a way to show the environment in, in a better way than just doing it in 3D in front of you. And the puzzles themselves, are they subsects of that painting or does it pull out any aspect of the original painting into those puzzles that are within that chapter? When you're playing the levels, the origami that you will connect, for example, the frog will be there when it's raining. The table elements, uh, like the snail that comes in, are elements that are off it. The levels itself have more been designed to go up and down in difficulty as you play along with the level, but not directly connected to when and where in the game, but everything around you is connected to uh, the weather. Gotcha. And then I'm curious, is there a physical tint book that you guys have as kind of a memento of the game that was like replicated from what you created for Apple Arcade? I definitely want to create one. But uh, so far, there hasn't been one. But yeah, I, ha I have thought about that process myself of how we can actually get our hands on the book. All the paintings you see in the books, the chapter screens, we're actually getting the real copies shipped to us now. If you go to the credits page, all of that is actually hand-drawn in uh, watercolor by my sister in Denmark. And the picture of uh, Tomek, Mika and I is, is by uh, Sarah Vass, another uh, artist in Denmark uh, that's commissioned for that. And those paintings we actually have in our office. 
uh, as real ones. I've been working in tech, IT and gaming for so many years and creating so many things that is only existing in the pixels on your computer. This is actually the first time that we have created something that is both on your tablet, but also something we can see in real life that we have created and it feels fun. Yeah, it's really cool. So those are actual water paintings rather than starting on an iPad, painting it there digital first. I love that. That's great. And we actually, we spend a long time trying to get all these paintings created on iPad because even the technology was there. If you look at, uh, we also were in touch with the Procreate team and the others, but a lot of the, the ways that you paint, you don't necessarily on an iPad when you're creating a, a normal a painting app on an iPad, you don't try to replicate a normal watercolor because you now have technology to be able to make it more beautiful, faster, in a more easier way for the artist. If you check out, for example, the, the Procreate site, we had to go more traditional and go with real paper and pencil, even though I would have loved to create this entire game uh, on an iPad. What are some of your favorite little touches found in Tint? Small things like if you ever play the, the, the levels with the snail, try to tap the snail's head and it will actually pop it back into its shell. There are a lot of these small elements. I think you can click on any table element, especially the ones in the right corner. We're a very small team. So it's basically just developer Tomek, uh, my designer Mika and, and me creating the game. And there has been times where we are designing something and putting so much energy into one element where we're like, will anybody ever see this or will ever think about it? But it just makes it joy to spend the time on, on those small details. So try to tap the elements. Yeah, even things like uh, the Apple Pencil pressure and also just the amount of energy that we have put into the paint. Put up the game on a 4K TV or on a Retina iPad and actually try to paint and look very closely at that. My friends have been making a lot of fun of me of how interested I was in paint and how proud I was of the paint we had created in the game. But if you look really closely and you compare it to other paints, it's really good. It's really nice. Uh, so there's so much small details in it that nobody will never ever really see. But when you see it as a full picture, it just feels like good product that doesn't necessarily have made the design or development process easier in any way. And something I noticed is you can restart a level by double tapping the screen. Did you experiment with different ways of letting the player do this? Yes. So we have from the beginning tried to create an entire game without using text whatsoever, because also it's more aesthetically pleasing to have people figure it out themselves. It's easy on translations. It's just nicer. But explaining people how to reset a level where we don't want text in the game, we don't want uh, UI elements was really, really hard. When you see people playing the game and they get frustrated with something they did or want to raise something, the first gesture, gesture they always did was double tap the screen. So that's actually where we kept it in. And it's just a natural way. So people who haven't even played through the tutorial and seen that they can double tap automatically do it and learn it that way. We will, however, in the next update, even though we don't like it much, but we will add a small button so that you can actually in the book have a, a physical button that you can click for it as well in a similar style to the hint button. But in the beginning, we didn't want anything to do with any type of game UI because it wouldn't normally have game UI in the painter's book. And that's where we argued to not have any of it. But of course, we want to open it up for a bigger market. And that's also where you will have the, the double tap or the reset the level as a small button. Designing a game for Apple Arcade, did that change your approach to how you design Tint and the monetization of it? I have been doing freemium games for many years where my core focus was how we could squeeze people of spending more money in the game. And over time, that gets really frustrating and, and it doesn't make it fun anymore. So when I sold my prior studio, Playlab, and started Lücke, our main goal was just to make things that we thought was fun and interesting. And that's where we can play around with a lot of different technologies. We kept the team small so that we can do crazy things and focus more on the premium type games because of those, we don't have to think about monetizations or, or anything else. With this Apple Arcade, we obviously found a deal with Apple that we were very satisfied with and it, because it opened us up for the opportunities that we were always looking for as a developer to just focus on making great games. And what it also allows us to is to be able to update the game and take it much further than we have ever thought possible before with a small team just by making it for arcade. That's great to hear. And you mentioned future updates. 
What do you expect the kind of pace will be for new level packs and updates to tents? So we're discussing it right now. We will be releasing another 150 levels, 200 levels for tin. There will come another three books in the game where each book will have uh, 50 levels in each as a minimum. The update schedule for that is something that we still need to figure out. We want to keep them to players as they are ready, but there's, of course, also a lot of quality assurance. We are a small team, so we can't necessarily put them out. If it was super easy to do everything, I would push levels every week. I think we have to do it maybe every month and then just push a little bit more. Instead of having the players wait for several months for a new pack of level, I would much rather just push them out as they're ready and give people content for a long time. And have you considered creating a level builder for having users kind of experiment and build their own puzzles with intent? We have a level builder now. It would be easy for us to build. We kind of need to find a way to allow people to create the levels, share the levels, and, and all of that. And this is some of the things where... As a small team, we have to focus on, find a few focus points, like should we focus on making more levels ourselves and make the game better, or should we open it up for the players? We would love to have more people help us create levels. It's also something we actually have several designers now working freelance with us just to create new levels, because for us, we simply just send them an iPad build where they have the editor and they can then send us levels, which we can then improve from our side and, and push into the game. I would love to do it at big scale, but we also need to be a really about the manpower that we do. So it's not something that is going to happen over the next few months, uh, but it's definitely something that we have thought about. We just need to find the, the best approach for it. Yeah, the first party from you levels and having quality levels would be what I want more of. Exactly, yeah. At some point, adding that it would be a nice uh, thing for extending the life even further of the product. So the freelancers, they're actually designing levels within a build of tint on their iPad. Is that where you actually design your levels as well for like the original release? Was it built on iPad and kind of sent over to whatever Xcode to do the final build? Or how did that all work? Yes, it's actually all built on iPad, a majority of it. Because even on an iPad, you can actually paint much better and it's more creative process to do it that way than you would on a computer. Because drawing with a mouse, unless you have a vacuum to draw with, drawing on an iPad is just a lot more smooth feeling. We have the right resolution. You can instantly click to play the game and it just feels natural way to do it. So yes, we have an editor where you can paint all the lines. You can have all the start point, end points. You can create the hints. Also, so if you look at the hand that are painting and the hints, that's actually a designer who have solved the level at that exact speed to help you throughout the game. And we'll continue developing an iPad because it just feels normal. And we want to go for that handcrafted feel rather than the computer generation as mentioned. It just feels natural that whatever we draw on an iPad when the users also play it on a, on a, on a tablet. That's really cool. And anything else we didn't cover about Tint that you'd like to before we wrap it up? No, it was just really an enjoyable project for us to build. And there's a lot of small details in the game as you play along. And, and we are focusing heavily right now on getting out the next update, getting it ready for the store and getting out to players. So that's what's really exciting for us. What's the reception been like? Have you been getting some feedback from the players solving these puzzles? I have released many games throughout my life. This is actually the best reception I have ever gotten of any game. People write really long reviews about how they enjoy it. We also had a very stable build that, that came out with limited box. There are a few that we will fix, but people have really received it well because they feel that it's a little bit different. A lot of people, including friends, have kind of been like, oh, why are you creating a kid's game? Then they try it and then they get into it. And we actually have a lot more adults, like, it's, it is actually designed for, I would say, uh, 30 plus. And we have a lot of those players really just appreciating, sharing their photos with us, sharing the enjoyment of the game. And it really warms your heart when you've been working so hard on something for so long that we really get good feedback. We, of course, have not been some of the massive teams that have launched and, and, and haven't necessarily gotten the, the full spotlight yet. But this is where we can see people that are now picking up the game and finding it interesting and sharing with us, which is it's, it's just really nice feeling. Yeah, the love for what you guys created shines through with all the little attentions of detail. It is just, it's a, it's a game that is just something very special. And I'm glad that you guys spent the time to build it. Thank you very much. So are there any other games on iOS that players should be aware of that your studios made? 
So I'm sure a lot of players will click on Tint and they will click on our development profile of being like, oh, I want more games like that. And you will find absolutely no games that are like that. There are a few titles because as a studio, we really just do things that we find fun. And there are two main titles there. One is Amon, which is an AR game that was created as one of the first AR kit games uh, when the iPhone 10 came out. And that is where we try to find the first few ways to use AR to construct statues by moving around in your room. The second title you'll find in there is uh, AI, AI Evolution, which is completely different than anything else because we really wanted to play around with machine learning of figuring out how can we use machine learning in games to further explore, like to train your own AI. So that game is actually about building your own character. And then we are using the on-device machine learning to train that animal and people are competing of how far that they can get their different creatures to walk. It's one of those games where we spend, of course, a lot of effort on it. It's a lot of fun. It's never going to make any profit whatsoever, but it was really interesting and it was really fun to work in that way. And as we go along with game development, we will just try out a lot of different things and, and sometimes we'll combine it. But we always just been wanting to play around with new technologies and getting our hands, new platforms. And you will definitely see that in our portfolio of games uh, because most of it is just things that we thought was fun, but always keeping a nice level of quality on them. Excellent. And where can people find more information about Tint and those titles? So I think our Facebook is probably the best or our Twitter you can find us on uh, Lug Studios, L-Y-K-K. E studios. Lücke actually means uh, happiness and wealth in Danish. So that was why I was picked. Follow us there. And then we try to do projects that are only less than three months, but of course doing something for arcade, it's a longer process. We really try to keep the team small and just put out things that we think are fun. And that's what we like to play around with. So it's a lot more on the creative studio type than an actual game game studio. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Jacob, for your time uh, today. It has been just so great learning more about Tint and kind of what went into building this. And thanks again for your time. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you for having me on. Well, that was my interview with Jacob. I'd like to thank him for his time recording this episode. And if you haven't already, go and download Tint from Apple Arcade. As I mentioned at the top of this episode, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Every review goes a long way in helping others discover the show. You can send your feedback to me at applearcadepodcast at gmail.com. You can find the website at applearcadepodcast.com and you can follow the show on Twitter at applearcadeplus. And the next episode is Dead End Job. This is a fun 90s stylized part shooter, part Luigi's Mansion game with a bit of Ren and Stimpy mixed in. So if you want to play that ahead of time, that is what's coming up next on Apple Arcade Plus. Thanks again for listening. Talk to everyone again real soon.